Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation, the interview series about topics that affect the mind, the body, and life around us. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to Paul Grief, co founder and CEO of PastureBird, the country's largest supplier of real pasture raised free range chicken. Paul has an amazing life story turning a personal health problem into an innovative and highly successful farm operation that generates animal-based foods in a way that is good for the environment and for our own health. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, Emran. Thanks for having me. Let me start out with, with a personal question, and I'm sure you've been asked that many times. What happened in your life that made you change your trajectory from being a certified public accountant to becoming one of the most well-known and successful CEOs of a sustainable farming and poultry operation? <laughs> I don't know about that last part. We'll see about that. But um, yeah, it's been an amazing adventure for about the last 10 years, uh, been on a health journey. So coming out of college, uh, I was constantly in the ice bath. I was an athlete and constantly in the ice bath, constantly battling with sore knees and sore back. And that really got worse as my time in the military continued. Um, everything from just couldn't breathe through my nose you know, sore neck, didn't sleep well, brain fog. And I had some buddies back in that time, 2007, that said, hey, there's this new thing called paleo um, and you should try it. You know, it seems like you have a lot of the symptoms. And I thought it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of, you know, eating like a caveman and doing all this stuff. But I figured I'd try it because I was pretty miserable. And a couple of weeks later, I felt like a kid again. I could breathe through my nose. I had so much more energy. I was sleeping well again. And that really caused my family to go down this rabbit hole of learning about food and health and really just connected the fact that what you put into your body affects the way that you feel. I'd never thought about that before in my whole life. Um, and sure enough, we started buying these cage-free, free-range, grass-fed, organic meats and really trying to spend whatever money it took to buy the best stuff possible. And unfortunately, we learned that so many of those labels are just empty claims. Um, for example, antibiotic free chicken had antibiotic its entire life. Free range chicken probably never went outside a single day in their life. And this stuff was so mind blowing to us. We just said, well, let's just get some chickens for the backyard and try it ourselves. And uh, now five years later, we've got about 50,000 chickens outside on pasture and sheep and pigs and cattle and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's been quite the adventure. Yeah, it's really an amazing an amazing story and um, um have you stayed with the what what kind of i mean i may ask you this right now <clears throat> what kind of diet have you um, stuck with or have you modified it or um, i mean obviously a very health conscious person yeah so um i guess it would look something pretty close to paleo still um we've modified it to work for ourselves you know stuff like white rice i found that i just really don't have a huge problem with it personally um We've reincorporated a few things, but for the most part, it's, I, would, I would call it a low inflammation diet. And um, also, more in the last couple of years, trying to focus not just on what you're not eating, but more about what you are eating. You know, these rich probiotic foods and eating the organ meats from the animals. There's a lot of things that aren't, we're not just looking at what not to eat. It's like also, let's look at what should we be eating as well. Yeah, it seems like now on, on the labels of, of a lot of foods, there's more um, what's not in it than, than what's in it. And if, if you look exactly. at the things that are in it are usually, you know, names and chemicals, they don't even know what they are. So Exactly. Um, yeah, really trying to eat for nutrient density and, um, and gut health too. I mean, that's huge for us. And so I know we were introduced about three, four years ago, I think out here in Temecula. And um, just right off the bat, it just made instant sense to me. The mind, the gut. They speak to each other. It, it just totally resonated with us and our family. So it's been cool. Great. So you have two companies now, Primal Pasture and Pasture Bird. What's the difference between these two companies? And are they doing the same thing in different settings? Or uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll take a second to explain. So when we started the farm about six years ago, we called it Primal Pastures. It was our family business. Um, our goal was to really raise is just the absolute highest end premium meats that we could. So everything was not only raised outside on pasture, rotational grazing and all this stuff. We also fed the animals only certified organic, you know, no soy feeds as well. 
for the monogastric animals. That's the chickens and the pigs. The cows and the sheep will only ever have grass. That's it. But for monogastric animals, it's a little more complicated. You know, what do you feed them and stuff like that? We only did that for primal pastures. And for about three years, the business grew. It was really great. And um, we eventually started having a lot of chefs call and ask if we could provide this kind of chicken for their restaurant. And when they loved it, and then when they came out to the farm, they were so excited until we showed them the price tag. And they were kind of like, oh my gosh, that's it would never work. And so after a little while, um, they were asking us to produce a pasture raised, still outside pasture raised, no antibiotics, really healthy and clean, but not certified organic um, for the restaurant market. And at that point, we didn't want to convolute the brand with Primal Pastures. We always wanted that to be the absolute premium high end. Um, but we saw a market opportunity for a really nice pasture raised chicken that wasn't certified organic that could hit restaurants and some grocery stores and butcher shops and stuff like that. So Prim Primal Pastures remains still today. You can order, I think, 11 states, home delivery, chicken, lamb, beef, pork, even some fish. I, I consider it the best meat that you can buy in, in the United States. Uh, and then Pasture Bird was formed to really do wholesale. So restaurants, we serve about 60 restaurants around California, Arizona, Nevada, and then um, you know, wholesale markets and stuff like that. Yes, I mean, you, <clears throat> you brought up one point, which is the cost. Um, and I was going to ask you, I, I, I didn't know there is a difference between those two operations but in general it's a pretty stiff price tag and not everybody can afford it so right. is this something i mean you're concerned that basically the, it's only for the well to do that that, right. that can buy your products uh, i am concerned with that that's kind of what we work on every single day i never got into this uh, first of all i never even tried to get into this but i never got into it thinking that i wanted to feed rich people you know I want to make this as widely available as possible. Part of that is on us and part of it's on the consumer. We have, we really have an imperative that we need to bring our prices down. So with scale and with good technology, I think that you can produce an equal, if not better product with uh, lower prices over time, but also the consumer needs to reprioritize and spend some extra money on their food too. So a lot of farmers go, go out and they say, oh, it's so frustrating. Consumers won't spend never gonna be able to do it. And I say, well, we both, we, I mean, we need to meet in the middle somewhere. Just like when the iPhone came out and it was $800 and nobody could afford it. Only a few people had it. Now everybody has it. Um, people never would have thought we'd spend $400 for a phone, but we've all sort of as a society realized that it's a better product. And so now almost everywhere you go, people have these iPhones. And um, I think over time, it won't happen that fast, of course, but maybe over time, 20, 30 years, our goal would be to see factory farming completely ended and pasture-based regenerative agriculture scaled up with good technology to the point where people can actually afford it. Um, and it is the majority of the market share. So that's, that's what we're hoping for. Okay. <clears throat> as you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, as you mentioned earlier, modern agriculture practices and products have had a detrimental effect on both human health, um, but also on animal welfare and on the environment. And there's a growing movement towards a more sustainable form of food production, um, which includes a more plant-based diet. How, how do you see yourself with your successful operation in meat production? Uh, how do you see yourself and your company in this development? Right. So, I mean, farming has really gone from the early 1900s, which it was still a good food system in the early 1900s, to the 1950s, where it became manufacturing. And that worked really well. If you look at planes and trains and automobiles and a lot of different things, it, it worked really well for society. However, for food, it's been an outright, I mean, it's been a disaster for human health, for animal welfare, for environment. Um, and so when we stop looking at this as farming and we start looking at that as manufacturing, of course, you know, you produce as many outputs as you can for the lowest cost possible. Um, we see things totally differently, hopefully a little bit more like our ancestors did in a more holistic way. Uh, and we're not the only ones. You know, we, we see an opportunity to provide really high animal welfare, build soil health and organic matter, sequester carbon, feed people the best food possible, totally regenerative to their body and their mind and their spirit. Um, that can all be done through proper animal husbandry and proper care, but it's certainly not the mainstream. So when people talk about the environmental impact of farming, 
I say I'm not only right there with you, I'm actually more opposed to factory farming than probably anybody else out there. So I have a lot in common with the vegans and the vegetarians and the people that hate factory farming because I'm, trust me, I'm right there and I'm trying to create an alternative to it. You mentioned that already a little bit in, in, in order to say, but what's the most unique about the way you raise chickens and other farm animals for food? Uh, okay, so 99.999% of livestock production now is stationary. Um, they're inside of a, so let's take chickens, for example, or pigs. They're both raised the same way. It's a, about a 600 foot barn, 40 feet wide, about 40,000 chickens inside of there. They're walking on top of each other. They're defecating in the same place that they live, the same place they eat and the same place that they, that they sleep. Um, your doctor, you can imagine the health implications of us, you know, defecating where we live and never moving. Of course, in nature, animals are never stationary. They're always on the move. And so what we do is we just try to replicate nature as close as possible. We put the animals outside. So it's not access to the outdoors. It's they live outside on the pasture and they're moved every single day to a new spot of pasture. So their poop goes down into the soil and it becomes the best fertilizer that mankind has ever known. Better than anything Monsanto's been able to come up with yet. But after 24 hour period, they're going to move off of that and they're going to move to a fresh spot of pasture where they can eat fresh grasses and bugs and seeds and worms, but they also have clean bedding, fresh air, sunshine, so many of the things that they would have in nature. So we're really just looking at nature as the template and trying to replicate that as close as we can. Your, your companies have grown from a small family farm to one of the biggest suppliers of poultry in the country and you keep growing. What's the basis of this remarkable success? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you talk to chefs, it's all about flavor. So when you raise an animal, especially a chicken outside where they're eating a mixed diet of all these healthy foods, they grow much slower because they're getting a lot more exercise. It's a lot more nutrient dense because it's more calories going in to produce the same amount of kind of finished animal. Um, it's all about flavor for them. So we've had great success growing the restaurant side of the business because of taste. For the home consumer, though, it's much more about health or sometimes environmental impact and animal welfare too. But the average home consumer is looking at this as, you know, you got way more vitamin A, D, E, you've got way higher omega-3s, you know, you got so much better saturated fats and, and so much better rates of all this actual nutritional information that you have a lot of people look at it that way. And then, like I said, you also have the people that are concerned about the environment or concerned about animal welfare. So I guess people come into it for different reasons. For me, the big driver has always been environment. I love animals and I care about health too, but um, to be able to experience the beauty that is a regenerative, beautiful, wild grass ecosystem and to learn about the carbon sequestration possibilities with that, um, it's really, really remarkable to go out and walk the fields and see um, what looks simple, which is a pasture ecosystem, but is actually probably like the gut so highly dynamic, so much going on, so much we still don't even understand. Uh, it's really a beautiful thing. I mean, talking about this topic of the ecosystem, so you, you, you probably know about this long grass prairie um, ecosystem that used to exist in, I, I guess, like 70% of the U.S. before right. colonization uh, and which pretty much disappeared down to, I think it's now less than 4%. And wow. um, a similar kind of concept that uh, Bison was sort of one of the, the keystone species in this ecosystem. So wherever the people have started again to do these, these bison farms, they, you know, some of that grassland is, is, is coming back. Um, That's right. do you, have you seen any change in the, in the grasses and, and, and the, the natural environment that grows in this area where you move your animals around? And, Oh, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. So what we like to say is we're not sustainable, right? We're not sustainable and our goal is not to be sustainable. Sustainability works when you already have something that's good. When you have something that's highly degraded, you need regeneration. So we like the term regenerative agriculture. And what that means is that every single year, the land can get healthier and healthier. Um, and so you brought up a great example of the bison, you know, and um, there are about 60 to 80 million bison in the country, the United States. Um, about 200 years ago. Nowadays, there's about 80 to 100 million cattle in the United States. 
So this whole idea that we have too many cows and they're causing all these methane and all this stuff, it's just simply not true. That's easily refuted. The problem is we say it's not the cow, it's the how. It's the way that, we're, that, we're, that we're raising these animals now that's the problem, not how many of them that we have. If they were moved around in uh, rotational grazing and holistically managed the way that the bison were, because the bison were in big herds, they'd eat the grass, poop on the ground, and then they'd move to the next spot. And that process happened for millions and millions of years. That's how we have the rich, fertile black soil that grows all the best corn and soybeans in the world for the last 50 years. So when we're out there farming, uh, we go off this number called soil organic matter, or SOM. Um, and we, when we get onto a piece of farm property, we'll test it. And then throughout every quarter, we'll kind of test it as it goes. And to see that increase, then you see the diversity of the plant species increase. When the plant species increase, you see all this new wildlife come on. So we see snakes and birds and wild geese and you know butterflies. And then of course, if you were to put it under, under a microscope, you just see a plethora of bacteria and nematodes and all these amazing little animals that you can't really see. Um, so it's just, it's shocking how fast nature can actually regenerate using animals though. That, the key is really animals that you can't do it without it. Um, it's this kind of fascinating idea that animals and plants, we've separated them, but really to fertilize plants, you need animals. And so it's a, it's a really a beautiful system the way it's created. And I think we just have to get back to honoring that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, Pasture Bird is the first Southern California farm to achieve certified wildlife friendly status. Um, it's something I didn't really know until I read about this on, on, on one of the articles that have been written mm -hmm. about your uh, operation. Can, can you explain how you achieved the certification and, and what it means? Well, the idea is that you're creating habitat for wildlife, which sounds really nice until you have something called coyotes, which we have really bad in Southern California. So for about the first year, we were farming, doing well, everything was fine. And then pretty soon we would order 500 chicks to raise. And by the time we processed or slaughtered them, there would be like 400 or 300 birds. And we couldn't figure out where all the animals were going. Um, and so finally one night, we stayed up all night and we just saw these coyotes coming into the fence, taking a few birds at a time and taking off. And then another one would come and this process was happening every single night. Um, and so as a trained sniper in the Marine Corps, I thought, well, there's only one way to solve this problem, right? It's to go completely against nature and to just kill every single coyote that comes into the field. And as soon as I got up there and I started doing that, it just did not feel right. It, there's something about it. You know, we're trying to participate with nature. We're trying to go one with all this. It just didn't feel good at all. And so sitting on my phone, sitting up there in the tree, and looking up how did people protect livestock before there were guns, right? And of course it came back to these dogs. And so there's dogs from all over the world, but they're typically called livestock guardian dogs. Um, and so I found a couple of them. A Great Pyrenees is the breed that we use along with also Anatolian Shepherd. And we brought them out to the farm and these dogs promptly fell asleep in the pasture. But then as soon as the sun went down, these dogs just instinctively started roaming and barking and scaring away the coyotes and doing this amazing thing. And uh, we haven't lost a single animal to a predator in about five years now. And because of that, we provide this really great ecological habitat for wildlife. And that means birds and deer and bobcats and coyotes that can all come through, but we protect our actual livestock with the dogs, which is a non-lethal way to do it. And so um, different environmental organizations, including Certified Wildlife Friendly, are trying to encourage this kind of farming that promotes wildlife, um, but at the same time, you know, you can still protect your livestock. And so proving these models actually do work is, has been pretty cool. Really fascinating to hear this. I mean, I, I, I had the, the personal experience um, doing a long distance hike in the Pyrenees uh, a couple of years ago. And, nice. and, and we did see these dogs. I mean, just what you're explaining, you know. Um, With the sheep? And, with, with the sheep and basically yep. defending them against the wolves that they have there. Yep. So, yeah, That's right. yeah, I mean, we, we didn't even train the dogs. So they're so instinctive at this point. I mean, these dogs have been bred for a thousand years to do that exact job. So by the time we get them now, 2019, it's like they already, even as puppies, yeah, they already know what to do. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, there, there are endless raging discussions about the benefits of a primarily animal meat and fat diet versus a predominantly plant-based diet. And I'm, I'm sure th these 
debates will probably never end because it, it, it has people on both sides that sure. that truly believe in that. On, on on what side of the debate do you stand? And I I think I asked this before. What what type of diet do you eat? Do you and your family eat? I've said this a lot of times on social media and other forums and stuff, but I'm I'm just uh, trying to help people understand that you can factory farm plants and you can factory farm animals. Um, and you can really do environmental damage and damage to animal welfare, even eating kale. Um, people forget to realize that the most anti-vegan concept in the world is actually pesticide. So if you take a single shot on a hundred acre field of pesticide, as long as we consider all animals as animals, um, that can be everything from a small nematode all the way up to a cow and a caterpillar and a squirrel and a rabbit and everything in between. Um, they're both equally harmful, right? I mean, you could factory farm and disc and till and fumigate a kale field or a potato field just as well as you can do um, an animal field. And so I've really just tried to focus my diet around things that are regenerative to nature. Um, and so I'm a huge fan of plants. I eat lots and lots and lots of salad and uh, I love beets and I love all the, the beautiful array that comes from nature from the plant side, but I also, don't feel any worse or better about eating um, animals when they come from a regenerative system. I think that there's lots of evidence. I mean, walk into a compost pile and put that under a microscope and there's things eating things all day, every second of every day, just on your own body right now, there's little animals eating each other all over your body. I mean, it's a, it takes life to sustain life. And I think that's a concept that's been lost on us in the 20th century, 21st century, um, but it really does. So my diet really, it just revolves around trying to find regenerative foods that are good for my body, not just not bad for my body, but good for my body um, and that I feel good about eating as well. Yeah, this is really sort of a, a great uh, third way, I, I would say, you know, that bypasses the, the extremes and, and so almost like religious uh, defense that right. some of the proponents do. I, I think it's really, it's really interesting how you explain that. Well, we, we look at things myopically we try to look at them in little solitude baskets it just life doesn't work that way and i think being on a farm for the last six years has helped me understand how interconnected all things in nature really are um, the grasses directly thrive off of the manure that comes from the animals that thrive off the grasses that's a perfect example of the loop um, and all plants are that way all plants require animals to really sustain them you look at chemical fertilizers i mean all that is is trying to replicate animal processes from the wild and so i think we have so far to go in food production and getting back to something that looks regenerative and truly sustainable um anybody professing to have all the answers i don't trust at this point i think we have a lot of work to do probably 50 more years before we can even get close to saying that we're happy with where it's at but as long as everybody acknowledges the problems and sees them for what they are, the problem's not animals, the problem's not plants, the problem's looking at these things through a, a little microscope instead of seeing it as a whole. Uh, and I think when we can get back to that, we're gonna actually start to make some progress. Um, are you concerned with the rapid growth that you've experienced from a small family operation to you know, a, a, a really impressive um, size company now are you concerned that you're gonna ultimately gonna make the same, go, get into the same direction as, as um, you know, family farms or other uh, food producers faced when they went from this transition to from 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 family uh, family farms, similar to what what you have done, to to the current industrial style uh, production? Do, I mean, do you see that? danger for yourself as well yeah of course i mean it's something we we look out for all the time is how do we as we grow how do you do that responsibly and how do you keep the quality at the same level or better um, as you grow and so we've kind of outlined a really simple set of standards we mostly talk about chicken that's the main protein that we produce so how do you maintain or increase quality while growing 10x or 100x and so for us that just means you keep the standards really simple what that means is Every chicken will be moved to fresh green pasture every single day. How that's done or the way it's done or anything else, I'm a little bit um, agnostic to, but if we can find technology that'll move 10,000 chickens at a time instead of 100 chickens at a time, if I can find technology that will automate that versus a human 
being having to go out there and pull it and break their back every day to do it. Um, I'm all for appropriate technology that still satisfies the, the goal or the standard, um, but just absolute not willing to sacrifice on our standard, which is moving animals to fresh pasture every single day. Uh, the second it goes away from that, I give you full license to, you know, call me out and come punch me in the face because that's, I'm just, I, I didn't get into this for that. I didn't get into this to sacrifice our integrity or our standards. Uh, another danger, so you're big enough now that th th these, these, these mega companies, um, chicken producers, um, they, they, they must have taken notice of your successful operation and uh, strategy. Have they approached you to work with them and uh, would you be willing to do that? My answer to that has actually always been, I hope that they do. Not really yet. Um, but I hope that they do take notice because I look at stuff on a macro level. We're not going to make, I mean, you, it sounds like we're big because we're the biggest pastured poultry operation in the United States, maybe in the world. Um, to put things in perspective, we produce somewhere around 7,000 chickens every week right now. A small farm in the United States probably produces about a million birds per week. So we're still on such a micro scale that it's not even registering with anybody yet you know we're big for what we do but we're tiny in the grand scheme of things there are nine nine billion chickens produced in the u.s for food every single year um it's my sincere desire that big ag if you will will see this and um they'll see that the consumer demands are shifting and instead of finding another fake marketing term to trick people into doing what they do and selling it as something else i hope that they go no i think we need to look at our production strategies and use what's good from our operations, but also leverage um, what can be better and um, move away from the stationary confinement model and move into something more mobile. And of course, the industry is wrought with different problems, but if we could just move from stationary systems to mobile systems and change nothing else, uh, we'd be in such a better place with our food system. So I'm not afraid of working with somebody big down the road. I think I would be honored to actually if it was the right person and they were in it for the right reasons. Um, but no, that, that hasn't happened yet. So along the same lines, I mean, how, how do you see your companies in 10 years from now? I'm, I'm sure you must you know, have we would that. We would like to be leading the sort of pasture chicken revolution. Uh, we would love to have a nationwide brand that people see and they can trust without having to have a million different certifying bodies and labels, trying to cover up different things, you know, just a true, transparent, seamless brand that you can actually visit the farms and you can see for yourself and you can trust that these animals are being treated in the most humane way possible, being rotated, the soils being taken care of, the environment benefits from the system. Um, all of that I think is possible within the next 10 years. I'd also have kind of an internal goal of producing all of our own feed. One of the big problems in chicken production and pork production is we rely on these grain inputs. So, you know, corn and soybeans and wheat and all these different items because they're a monogastric animal. They're meant to have grain. But the reality is you can't be uber regenerative or closed loop regenerative if you're taking all these off farm inputs and those guys aren't growing things regeneratively. So I'm the first one to kind of self-identify and say, Chicken's got farther to go than beef does. Beef is already being done regeneratively at scale, and it's really cool, and I support it. Chicken, though, until we can solve the grain issue, um, you can't really call it full cycle regenerative, and uh, that's okay. You know, We're going to take things one step at a time. We need to figure out how to produce birds on pasture at scale first, and once we've got that figured out, then we'll move on to the feedstock after that. Um, the really interesting thing is, though, when you run chickens on pasture, you get an issue in the soil. You start to get too much nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and it just so happens that the grains that need those items need a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. And there's only one way to really get nitrogen and phosphorus out of the soil. It's to export some kind of a crop off of it. So that could be grazing beef on the same land that you graze the chicken. It could be cutting hay and selling hay. It could be growing your own grains to feed back to the birds. And so. In the next 10 years, I definitely have the goal of growing our own feed, um, but we're not there yet. So I think we still have a lot to work on. Yeah, this is really fascinating to listen to this. I mean, I've, I've interviewed s several people, including um, Yvonne Trinard from uh, right. know, owner of Patagonia, who 
um, who has a very strong, I mean, they, they make some food items as well. And, uh, sure. you know, based on exactly the same principles that, um, that, that, that you've been explaining here, regenerative and circular and um, not just organic and not just uh, That's right. uh, sustainable. But uh, so this, this, this keyword is, is really regenerative and circular, um, giving back to the soil or, to, you know, to nature what you, what, what you take out of it. So I, it's really exciting to hear this from you. And, uh, I mean, Yvonne has been studying this for a long time. He's one of the most well-respected people talking about regenerative agriculture. And it's a great example. Um, you put something like that in the hands of a powerful company like Patagonia, and you can actually do a lot of good. Uh, I'm not inherently the guy that says big companies are just inherently bad. I think that they can be used for bad and good. Um, but in the same way that Yvonne's done a really good job telling that story with Patagonia and helping promote regenerative agriculture and even having some impact on the ground. Um, that's what we want to do too. You know, it's really about impact for us. This, yeah, this is really, it's, it's, it's really inspiring. Um, so if you, you've talked about transparency and people being able to, to, to check it out and I've actually driven by your pastures uh, and I've seen that myself. I, I haven't had a chance mm -hmm. yet to come to one of your events, but can, can you explain to the listener uh, how they, so what's the easiest way to learn more about your, um, your concept of agric agriculture and actually seeing it, um, you know, hands-on, so to speak? Yeah. Um, in a world where, you know, meat labels start to look like the side of a NASCAR race truck with a million different certifiers trying to say, oh, it's this and that. Um, we've gone a, co a totally different direction. We're not big on the labels. We say come to the farm and come see for yourself. We've had over 15,000 visitors in the last five years. And that's just what your grandparents did, right? They came out to the farm. They knew the farmer. They were able to shake their hand. Honestly, that's never been easier than now with social media. Um, it's not as good as coming to the farm, but you can go on and you can see pictures and videos, not just from us, but from other farmers across the country too. And you can get to know where your food comes from. Um, one of my favorite farmers says, you know, it's, it's shocking that we spend so much time picking out a mechanic to go fix our tires. Um, and we won't even take a quarter of that time to go invest in the person who's gonna grow our food. Um, and I always say, if food is gonna be your medicine, then farmers are your doctors. And those are people that are worth getting to know and investing a little time in. Um, so you can find out about our farm tours. They're all hosted through Primal Pastures. So www.primalpastures.com. There's a farm tour at least once a month. And we'd highly encourage you to come out if you're in the Southern California area or can be. Super informational. I'll say it's not a petting zoo. It's a, or it's a real life working farm. So, you know, bring kids and they're welcome to come and stuff like that. But we definitely talk education for about an hour. Um, and, and that's a lot of fun. Um, other than that, go on social media. If you're too far away or you can't make it or go visit another farm, but um, at Primal Pastures or at PastureBird on either Facebook or Instagram. You can also look us up on YouTube. Um, and yeah, you can just, it's just really important to connect with people in the food business and the food industry because it's never been easier before. And what I also say, people ask me all the time, well, how do I know if what I'm getting is real, if I'm at the farmer's market or somewhere else like that? You know, there's a lot of labels that are thrown out there in terms. Um, one thing I've told a lot of people is ask your farmer if you come out for a tour. Um, and if they say no, be a little concerned, you know? Uh, it's, I'm not saying that they're bad or that they're going to be a bad person or something like that, but be a little bit concerned and also ask to see some pictures of the farm. If they don't have social media, or they're not into that, ask to see some photos. They can print them out and bring them or they can show you usually on their phone. Um, and it, it, you don't have to be a scientist to look at a farm and see if it's good or bad. I think it's really, really simple to be able to just take a quick look at it, the video or picture and say, yeah, that's something I'd want to buy from or no, that doesn't look very good. It looks like a factory farm, you know. Well, thanks, Paul. This is for a, a really fascinating conversation. I, I'm sure the audience of this Mind Cloud conversation will really enjoy many aspects of this and we'll see similarities to other people that we have um, talked to from totally different areas of life, you know, science Definitely. and medicine. And so for me, it's always nice to see that convergence that we see now of um, forward-looking uh, people in, 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 in different parts of society that share the same philosophy and implement it in their own, uh, in their own area. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, your next book, it's got to be the pasture to gut connection. So <laughs> you, you let me know when you're ready to write that one.
Great, great title. Great title. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.